All right, hi everyone. My name is Ben. I'm excited to present Streamlit, textbook streamlined blockchains. This is joint work with Elaine Shi. Perhaps a better name for this talk is Consensus Made Simple. And the reason is, well, we know that consensus has this reputation for being hard to understand, hard to implement. And our goal is to design a simple consensus protocol that we can teach in 15 minutes. And hopefully uh, by the end of this talk, you'll have an idea of how Streamlit works. And yeah, so without further ado, let's just jump right into it. So blockchains, state machine replication, consensus, they're all kind of the same problem. And it's been a problem for the last 30 years. Uh, the problem setup is the following. We have N players. We know the set of players ahead of time. They're all going to be talking over a unreliable network, such as the internet. And a fraction of them, let's say a third, are going to be malicious or Byzantine. Yeah, so these bad guys are going to lie about their protocol state, and their goal is to subvert the protocol. They want to prevent the honest players from reaching agreement. What are we reaching agreement on? Let's say the honest players want to agree on the states of the blockchain. So maybe I've here uh, annotated them by colors. Uh, uh, the state can be anything like sets of transactions or server states. And the idea is that every player is going to be continuously running some consensus protocol. right? And we'll get as output a finalized chain, which might be updated over time. And the key property we want is consistency. Honest players must agree on their finalized chains. So what do I mean by that? Let's say you and I were uh, both players in a consensus protocol. And if you think that the first block is green, well, I had also better think that the first block is green. If you think that the second block is blue, I should think that the second block is blue. Maybe you think that the fourth block is purple. Maybe I haven't seen the fourth block yet. And that's allowed. Maybe my internet connection suddenly dropped. Um, but by the time I catch up, uh, I should also think that the fourth block is purple. So really, we should be agreeing on the state of the blockchain. And that's what I mean by consistency. Of course, we need one more property called liveness. We would like to be able to add new blocks to our blockchain in a reasonable amount of time. It turns out that consensus protocols for the last 30 years have become a pivotal component of our scalable internet infrastructure. And so basically, if you choose any major technology company, I would bet you that they're using a consensus protocol under the hood to power either some sort of distributed data store or to synchronize clocks or something like that. So already there's a big reason to study consensus. But more recently, and maybe one of the reasons we're all here, uh, proof of stake blockchains have the potential to make consensus ubiquitous. Uh, so projects like Ethereum or Libra and Algorand, they all use permission consensus under the hood. Uh, for instance, you can elect a committee and then run permission consensus on it. And then you can use these cryptographic techniques to make the whole system more scalable. So this potential impact makes it all the more important to study consensus and make it more simple because consensus protocols have a reputation. Protocols like Paxos and PPFT, classical protocols that everyone learns in a distributed systems class, they're complex, they're subtle, and they're hard to implement without bugs. And this reputation is quite deserved. Uh, I think these protocols are, are actually very complex. Um, but of course, where funding and problems come, uh, we also have innovation. So in the last 10 years, a lot of money and resources and people have, uh, well, a lot of talent has been invested in trying to uh, make blockchains better, especially proof of stake blockchains. And uh, in some sense, this also leads to better consensus protocols, right? So we've had this wave of innovation recently. Uh, and we have a lot of new ideas in, the, in this space, like it's something as simple as putting the parent block in the hash, sorry, a hash of the parent block in a block. Uh, these simple ideas have the potential to make consensus so simple. Uh, and that's uh, what we've been trying to unify. 
we take all of these new ideas in the field and we really, we have for you a simplest possible, easy to understand textbook consensus protocol. Your goal really is to unify all of these new ideas. And it's surprising how simple we can make consensus protocols. In fact, I'd argue that it's the perfect protocol for you to teach. And it's already being taught in some capacity at CMU and Stanford. So for the remainder of this talk, I'll be going over the protocol itself. And it's probably most instructive to deliver the protocol description up front and then go through an example. So that's exactly what we'll do. All right, so before we start, we have two assumptions that we make that are really nice. Uh, they make the problem easier to reason about. Of course, we can relax them in practice. Um, so the first assumption is that the protocol is going to run in synchronized epochs of one second each. So every player is going to have a locally synchronized clock, and everyone is going to enter epoch one at the same time. And then one second later, everyone is going to enter epoch two at the same time, and the epoch three, and so on and so forth. Okay. All right, and our second assumption is that every epoch is going to have a leader who is publicly known. We'll see why this is useful. So now let's describe Streamlet the protocol in a nutshell. At a high level, in every epoch E, starting in epoch 1, and then 2, and then 3, and so on and so forth, the leader is going to propose a new block. Right? And the block is going to have the structure hash of a parent block, the epoch number, which is important, and some set of transactions. And we'll describe how they choose this block soon. Now everyone else is going to vote for the first block they see from the leader subject to some voting rule. And, so, and it's really simple. In every epoch, we propose a block, and people vote for it. Next epoch, propose a block, people vote for it. Now to proceed, we have to introduce some terminology. Okay? So a notarized block is a block for which we see 2 n over 3 votes. Okay? So once 2 thirds of the network has voted for a block, and once we've seen those votes, then we deem that block notarized. So what's so special about 2n over 3? Well, because of the, 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 the following observation makes 2n over 3 special. Um, so let's say that we have two block proposals denoted by these dashed lines. Um, and say that the epoch 2 leader was malicious. So it, in fact, proposed two different blocks to different people. Note that an honest leader only proposes a single block. So we have the left block and the right block with different transaction sets. Um, and let's say that the left block got notarized, denoted by a siloed line. So we see two n over three votes for the block on the left. Then the question becomes, hey, can the block on the right get notarized? And the answer is no. Why? Well, there just aren't enough votes to go around. So our first observation that because is, is that everyone's only going to vote once per epoch. Right? Everyone only votes for the first block from the leader. Moreover, because blocks contain the epoch number, we know exactly uh, how many times we vote per epoch. So there's only every honest player is only going to vote once. Right? So really, the argument is that um, the number of honest votes left over, n over 3, plus the number of malicious votes is less than 2n over 3. So this block on the right, well, it simply cannot get notarized. So our lemma is that most one block per epoch can get notarized. Okay, it's actually quite nice, uh, and that's the reason why we vote. Uh, we work with notarized blocks and notarized chains for the remainder of the protocol. A notarized chain is just a chain of blocks in which every block is notarized. So now let's finish the protocol description. How does a leader propose a new block? Um, well, it chooses to extend the longest notarized chain that it's seen so far. And how do, how do voters decide what block to vote for? Well, they vote for a block if and only if that block extends one of the longest notarized chains that the voter has seen. So a player is always building off of the longest notarized chain that they've seen. That's really nice and really natural in our opinion. Um, and of course, uh, such a natural voting rule also gives rise to a very natural finalization rule. 
So we say that a notarized chain ending in three blocks with consecutive epoch numbers is finalized, chopping off the last block. And we'll see an example of this very soon. So I'll put the protocol at the bottom here for you, uh, for your reference. And let's walk through an example now. Let's say that we start with a genesis block, a genesis block, which is notarized. In epoch one, some the leader of epoch one, let's say Elaine, will propose a block for everyone. And all the voters, we're going to vote for that block. And let's say that that block accumulates more than 203 votes and that we see all these votes. So this epoch one block becomes notarized in our view. Same thing happens in epoch two. A leader proposes a block, people vote for it, and we see those votes. Let's say in epoch three, the, uh, a calamity strikes and the global internet goes down, so no progress is made. Let's say in epoch four, the internet recovers and our leader again proposes a block, people vote for it, and those votes at least get delivered to us. But let's say in the midst of all that, in epoch five, the, uh, the internet went down again and recovered in epoch six. But maybe our epoch six leader, they never saw the fact that our epoch four block here was notarized. Uh, maybe the votes just got lost in the mail. So they propose a new block that extends our epoch two block. And in fact, maybe all the voters didn't see these votes either that were lost in the mail. So they also vote for that block. So we can have a fork in our network. All right, and let's say epoch seven proceeds normally. The leader chooses to extend the epoch six block. Maybe the epoch eight block uh, leader chooses to extend the epoch seven block. And again, all the blocks are notarized. So all the blocks are signed by at least two over three processes or players. Now we see three epoch numbers in a row, six, seven, and eight. And a light should be going off in your head because this is exactly when we can apply our finalization rule. We know that a notarized chain ending in three blocks with consecutive epoch numbers, six, seven, eight, is finalized, excluding the last block. So we can finalize the genesis one, two, six, and seven blocks, which I've marked in green. We can argue, uh, and once we finalize these blocks, we can basically argue, hey, uh, we know that we've reached agreement on these green blocks. We can execute the transactions inside of them. So let's argue consistency. How can we be so sure that our finalization uh, rule works? Why is it that our longest notarized chain voting rule works? Um, and it's actually a very natural argument. So let's say that we had some competing block at the same height as the epoch seven block. I'll call it the epoch X block proposal. It suffices to argue that no such block can exist uh, that is ever notarized at least, and thus finalized. Why is that sufficient? Well, then we can argue that any finalized blockchain must contain the epoch seven block. And therefore we've reached agreement that way. Everyone must agree on the epoch seven block. To walk through the argument for why this is the case, let's consider the epoch nine block. And let's pretend that the epoch nine leader proposed a block extending the epoch four notarized block. The question is, hey, can our epoch nine block ever get notarized? Of course, the answer is no. Why? Um, well, we know that two thirds of the network voted for epoch eight. So a majority of honest players voted for this epoch eight block. Thus, a majority of honest players must have seen that the Epoch 7 block was notarized. Right? So by the time Epoch 9 rolls around, um, well, the Epoch 7 blockchain is the longest notarized chain that a majority of honest players have seen. So this Epoch 9 block proposal, it's too short. It extends a chain that is too short. In fact, the only way we'll vote for this epoch nine block is, it extend, if, is if it extends a longer blockchain, for instance, as I've shown on the screen. So we've just argued that this epoch nine block cannot be in the yellow region. Now a similar argument applies for any epoch number less than seven. So we can argue finally that our epoch seven block is unique at its height. That's really the crux of our consistency argument. All right, in conclusion, we have Streamlit, which is a surprisingly simple propose vote, propose vote consensus protocol, which happens to be a drop-in replacement for PPFT. 
and it's surprisingly simple, right? And I want you to walk away thinking, hey, wow, I'm surprised consensus is so simple. Um, and hopefully we can finally shake that reputation of consensus being hard to teach, hard to understand, and hard to implement. Right? And that, that's really my whole talk. Uh, for full proofs, please see our full paper or Elaine's new textbook. Um, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you very much.